Hey everyone, Dr. Jack Gordy here. Today I'm going to be giving you itchy skin because I'm going to be talking about scabies. Now, scabies is a mite, which isn't technically an insect, but is an arthropod that eats your skin. It's got eight legs, that's why it's not an insect. Um, and it eats your skin, tunnels little burrows in, and apparently is the most itchy thing you can get, which is quite a, it's a bold claim, but people say it's as itchy as it gets, scabies. All right, so let's jump into it. What is it? Well, here we can see it here, and it's typically just it's typically diagnosed by the symptom of itchiness and the location of that itchiness, which tells us quite a bit about it. For example, you get scabies infections quite often on the back of your hands or in between your fingers, and it's quite a rare place to get itchiness. Normally, you would associate itchiness with uh, head or armpit or pubic regions because of things like lice um, and so if you have itchy fingers it's a sure sign of scabies here we can see some of the skin damage that occurs as the scabies tunnels into your skin eating it um, as well as creating burrows in which to lay eggs um, what so what is it it's itchy that's what well, <laughs> yeah People say it's incredibly itchy. That's pretty much the definition of scabies. What causes that itch? Well, it seems to be predominantly our immune response to the scabies. So we release inflammatory things like histamines um, in response to these scabies infections. And it actually seems to be our immune response that makes them itchy. Um, and it's not just our immune response to the mite itself. It's our immune response to the feces of the mite as well. All right, so where does it sit on this global deaths per year graph that I've been showing? E. coli, influenza, malaria, staphylococcus, fungus, COVID-19, 4 million in one year. Um, scabies, where does it sit? Well, again, the error bars are massive on this, um, and some estimates put it at around 10,000. Now you might wonder, how can you die of scabies? Well, again, this is why the error bars are massive. Nobody dies of just scabies, right? Um, but your skin has a very important function and that is to keep out other pathogens. So if scabies are compromising your skin by um, eating away at it or you scratching away at it, then there have been many cases where uh, Staphylococcus aureus infections take over. No one's researched Candida albicans, but I'm sure we would find something similar where by damaging the skin we and creating pockets as well, which are, are difficult to clean and difficult to shed and damaging our barrier of our skin by digging uh, deep past our dermal layers, uh, no, past our epidermal layers, um, then that opens us up to the attack from the other pathogens and those other pathogens can kill you. Um, and there was one study actually done in Australia that showed that you had a threefold risk of death if you had a Staphylococcus aureus infection and a scabies infection compared to just having a Staphylococcus aureus infection. So um, that is how we think those deaths occur by making you more vulnerable to those infections. But how do you attribute it? And is it going underreported? And are scabies actually causing way more deaths than we think but they're just being recorded as staphylococcus aureus infections or another bacteria for example um, so it is a big maybe there's a lot of error bars in there but it's certainly not a great thing to have and it is definitely a pathogen all the time it's not debatable unlike some of the helminth worms up there but it's really prevalent so 200 million infections um annually so it's typically not a long lasting infection people get treatment because it's itchy um, although there are chronic cases and so uh, that is not uh, prevalence that's incidence 200 million a year of, of scabies of scabies infections incur which is so gross um, so how do you get it well you get it by holding hands or um, or or having close physical contact for a long period of time. You cannot get it just by a little rub, a little shake hands. It's typically seen as holding hands um, or, or uh, sexual relationships or intimate relationships where there is prolonged physical contact. Um, and that's re that's really important. You don't get it from shaking hands. We don't see that sort of infection pattern throughout the community. Um, we see it passing from um, partners, for example. Um, it has a very simple life cycle. Um, it lays its eggs in these little burrows. They grow up into adults. 
and they have sexual reproduction so it's not a complicated life cycle at all the females are a bit bigger and they are the ones that dig these giant tunnels a little cool thing is they dig little ear holes in these tunnels to make sure that there's good ear supply as they dig deeper and deeper down which is uh oh man i'm getting itchy i can feel it i'm getting itchy um yeah so they are obligate parasites they don't have um a vector like malaria and they don't have a spore stage so they pretty much are always living on skin and that's really important you can't really get it by a hotel bed for example we don't think um it doesn't seem they don't seem to stay alive or in features very long outside of the skin so prolonged skin to skin contact is sort of the um infectious epidemiology that seems to occur um where do they infect now i was going i was all prepared to tell you what i learned during my undergrad which was they like dry dead skin which is why they go for your fingers rather than moist um moist damp areas that contain antimicrobial oils called sebum that we produce so we produce a liquid called sebum um, and we produce a, a range of other uh, chemicals that are antimicrobial, antipathogen in our sweat. Um, and so I was, I came in here a hundred percent about to tell you that that's the same fact. But then when I went to research it, I couldn't find any studies on it until I found this one fantastic study. Now it was in Northern Europe, and they were. Uh, they used a data set that was collected from asylum seekers. Now it's an anonymized data, but because um, Northern European countries see human beings as human beings. When asylums come to their country, they accept them, and then they also um, evaluate their health and treat them of any medical conditions, and they record all that data for analysis. So this group said this is a great opportunity to look at scabies infections. Where does it infect people and how prevalent it is? They had 973 infections, which is quite a lot, and they um, drew up this diagram here of the most common regions of infections. So you can see those fingers and back of the hands and dry areas are 100% one of the highest, most prevalent regions of infection. But the groinal region was also the other highest region. Now there is nothing in common when you're talking about skin between the into into the the back of the hand skin and the sort of the in between finger skin region and the groinal region the groinal region is very hairy it's very moist has high levels of sebum the in between fig, fingle, fing, finger region of your hands is dry it has no no hair and it has very few secretions right so that to me says it's not the skin that explains the the distribution now to me this is clear as day it's transmission i mentioned the two most common ways of transmitting the disease are holding hands and having intimate sexual relations so to me when i look at those skin patterns it's to do with um <laughs> It's to do with how you got it and also what, what you touched afterwards, right? So you very rarely touch the back of your knee, um, perhaps, um, but you do scratch your thighs and your belly, maybe. Um, but maybe there are other skin factors going on there. Um, I just find that very fascinating that two of the most different regions of the of the skin uh, have the highest prevalence of scabies infections. So I'm not going to hand on to you that um, that concept that they like in between your fingers because it's dry and has thick skin to eat. Um, I'm just going to tell you that's the evidence there and you can draw your own conclusions about why they infect certain regions. Now they like to infect this region and they don't like to go below it. So this is mostly a highly keratin region with not a lot of um, living cells it's more the dehydrated um, uh, epidermis layers um, that we have that we shed all the time as part of our process to help protect us from pathogens we shed our skin um, and they like to eat it so they essentially just digest it they also poo in those tracks their nest tracks and that poo causes that immune response as well as that they do and that's where the itchiness comes from and i'll cover that when i cover the immune system on why inflammation makes you itchy now selective toxicity how do we get this well one of the great things is nature has done this for us evolution has done this for us plants do not like insects for the vast 
majority of the insects. They like bees, they attract them with this lovely pollen, but they do not like other insects that come along and eat them. So plants have evolved uh, and, and insects are undergoing chemical warfare. A lot of plants are producing um, anti-herbivory agents that will kill the insects and the insects are becoming resistant to those agents and they're at, at constant war. Nicotine, for example, is actually an insecticide. So that's why tobacco produced nicotine was to kill the insects. Um, and then we decided to smoke it for some reason. Now, uh, this plant, this plant, chrysanth chrysanthemums, um, they have um, permethrin, uh, which is an oil derived from these plants, and this chemical kills insects, but it also kills mites and other arthropods. So this is um, a fantastic natural source of a compound. Now, natural doesn't mean safe by any means. A box jellyfish is natural. It's definitely not safe chemicals there. But it's just to say that the plants have done the drug development for us. Through evolution, they've developed a very effective oil that targets arthropods like mites and insects. Um, it is a neurotoxin. It goes in and interferes with iron channels and iron flux is critical for neuronal communication and so it shuts down the nervous system. Um, and we use topical application as one method of selecting Activity. It's not very absorbed in the skin. If you have, it's not very well absorbed through the skin into our bloodstream. And so, if you apply a cream containing per, permethrin, permethrin, me and drug names. Oh boy, especially because it's ten o'clock at night. Anyway, <laughs> you rub this per, permethrin uh, on your skin, and you get selective toxicity because it's not absorbed into our bloodstream. Our skin is coated in a dead layer of keratin, and so it's a fantastic way just to kill the insects on the skin. There is a, a, a systemic drug called ivermectin that we can take, it goes into our bloodstream and it kills any insect that's biting us as well. Um, but I'll go into that later. The other thing is permethrin is quickly metabolized by our liver into a safe chemical. So even the small amounts that are absorbed are quickly metabolized by our liver. And it also has a lower effect on mammalian neurons. The plants evolved to attack arthropods, not to attack mammals. So the differences in our iron channels in our neurons is enough to have a small difference in effect of neurotoxicity. So there's a number of ways, this is actually a really cool drug to study, because there's a number of ways in which it is selectively toxic for the arthropods and not us. It's very cool. It uses topical application. Our liver can handle it. And our neurons, the protein structure of those ion channels is just different enough to give us a lot to for us to require a higher concentration of permethrin to get the same neurotoxic effects. Right, up next is C. elegans as an animal model. Now this is a nematode that we're going to use as an animal model for us, which is brilliant. <laughs> 